I don't own gold because I think it might go to 2400 or 2200 or whatever the number is. I own it because I'm afraid of the possibility, not the probability, but the possibility that it goes to $7,000 or $8,000 or $9,000. That's not very far-fetched. In the decade 2000 to 2010, admittedly it took 10 years, the gold price went up sevenfold. It doesn't seem like too much to ask given the deterioration in the purchasing power around fiat instruments for the gold price to triple. I frankly hope it doesn't, but I sort of think it will. Uh, I think you could see sharply higher gold prices. Gold rates have surged unprecedentedly at $2,397 per ounce, marking new records over the past seven trading sessions. This remarkable surge in gold prices is underpinned by several positive factors, injecting optimism into the investor community. Year on year, gold prices have surged by an impressive 16.5%, primarily driven by investor anticipation of a potential interest rate cut by the Federal Reserve. This anticipation has significantly boosted demand for the precious metal, as investors seek a hedge against economic uncertainty. Rick Rule, founder of Rule Investment Media, points out that the recent upswing in gold prices wasn't driven by retail investors worrying about their purchasing power, but rather by geopolitical maneuvers, particularly by the U.S. government. He highlights actions such as seizing Russian-held U.S. Treasury securities and weaponizing the SWIFT banking system as key factors driving other countries to seek alternative stores of value, with gold emerging as a natural choice. One of the main reasons driving the recent surge in gold demand is the role of foreign central banks, compelled by limited alternatives amidst geopolitical tensions. So far this year, central banks purchased 45 tons net of sales in January and 19 tons in February. Moreover, individual investors increasingly acknowledge the erosion of their purchasing power by fiat currencies, further bolstering the appeal of gold as a safe haven asset. Data from JP Morgan Chase underscores the minimal market share of precious metals and related assets in the US, currently constituting only 0.5% of total savings and investment assets. However, if this were to revert to the historical mean of 2%, demand for precious metals would quadruple, presenting a significant growth opportunity. Rick stresses the importance of adopting a long-term perspective when considering gold investments, considering factors such as the ongoing politicization of the US dollar and its diminishing purchasing power relative to other currencies. We will present clips from Rick Rule's interview, in which he expresses his bullish outlook on gold prices. But before we do, if you want more videos like this, please hit the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell for more updates. Thank you and enjoy the video. The recent strength in the gold price. This didn't happen because retail investors were concerned, expressing concerns about the deterioration of their purchasing power. It didn't happen for traditional reasons. It happened because the U.S. government weaponized the U.S. dollar. They confiscated $300 billion worth of Russian holdings of U.S. Treasury securities. That made other countries who don't necessarily favor policies that are attractive to the U.S. government concerned about their own holdings of U.S. Treasury securities. The second thing that the U.S. did is they weaponized the SWIFT banking system. The SWIFT banking system is supposed to be an international settlements mechanism using the U.S. dollar as the reserve currency. It is not the property of the United States. But when the SWIFT banking system began to be weaponized to further the political interests of the United States government overseas, other central banks felt themselves left with no choice other than to look for a, a store of value at a medium of exchange that was outside of the control of the U.S. government. The easiest place to go was gold. Many people say, well, why don't they just trade with each other in their own currencies? There's an easy answer to that. As little as they trust us, they trust each other less. The U.S. dollar, uh, laughingly, is the worst currency in the world, with the sole exception of every other currency. The Chinese don't want a trillion rubles. Uh, and what that means is that in order for Iran to trade with China, China to trade with Russia, Russia to trade with Brazil, they need a medium of exchange outside the U.S. dollar. And the strength that you have seen in gold has been almost entirely foreign central banks buying gold because they don't have any other other alternatives. If you lay on top of that uh, the realization on the part of investors that their own purchasing power is degraded by, hold, by holding fiat currencies, uh, I think you could see 
sharply higher gold prices. Here's another statistic to support that, James. According to J.P. Morgan Chase, the market share of precious metals and precious metals related assets in the United States is about one half of 1% of the total value of savings and investment assets in the United States. For reference, the United States has a 23% market share of world savings and investment assets. JP Morgan Chase suggests that the four decade mean market share of precious metals related securities is 2%. So if precious metals merely reverted to mean, demand for precious metals and precious metals related assets would quadruple in the largest savings and investment market in the world. And that's precisely what I think is going to happen. Just a reversion to mean. Just a reversion to mean quadruples demand. Remember that prices are set on the margin, not across the totality of the market. And I think that that could not next week, not the week after, maybe not this year, maybe not next year. I think if you think in five-year terms, six-year terms, seven-year terms, and you think about the continued polit politicization of the U.S. dollar, if you think about the deterioration of the purchasing power of U.S. dollars, particularly given low interest rates relative to the deterioration of the purchasing power of the dollar, and then you think about the infinitesimal market share enjoyed by precious metals. Those three factors come together, and I think they give you a picture uh, of what I actually believe is likely to occur in precious metals markets. Over the past couple of years, there has been a strong demand for gold from central banks. In 2023, central banks worldwide purchased 1,037.4 metric tons of gold, coming close to the record high of 1,081.9 metric tons set in 2022, as the World Gold Council reported. This consistent demand indicates a sustained interest in gold among central banks, with purchases exceeding 1,000 metric tons for the past two years. Rick observes that central banks clearly prefer acquiring physical gold rather than investing in gold stocks. This preference explains why there's a notable difference in buy orders between physical gold and gold stocks. While central banks focus on accumulating actual gold reserves, the interest in gold stocks varies significantly. Reflecting on the trends from the 1970s, it becomes apparent that many investors viewed gold stocks as a way to leverage the increasing gold prices. Yet, this pursuit frequently led them to invest in marginal and high-cost producers. Paradoxically, Leveraging gold prices tended to favor marginality, contributing to a decrease in free cash flow per share within the gold mining sector, despite the significant uptick in gold prices from 2000 to 2010. Looking ahead, Rick suggests that traditional gold stock buyers may reclaim prominence if the anticipated surge in the gold market materializes and control shifts from central banks back to the private sector. Let's get back to the interview. Well, first of all, let's remember that thus far, the buyers of gold have not been individual investors, not been people who buy gold stocks. They've been central banks. Central banks are not gold stock buyers. They're gold buyers. So when one wonders uh, about the discrepancy in buy orders between gold uh, and gold stocks, the gold buyer has been a very different constituency, one that's not interested in the stocks at all. It makes perfect sense, given the nature of the demand, that gold stocks didn't respond to the influx of capital into gold. The other part of the problems, I think, go deeper. Uh, if you go all the way back to the decade of the 70s, uh, I suggest that most investors in gold stocks owned them as leveraged proxies for the gold price. Ironically, of course, uh, leverage to the gold price rewards marginality, which is to say a high cost producer enjoys better margin expansion in a relative sense with higher gold prices than an efficient producer enjoys. As gold mining investors sought leverage, what they actually were seeking, unfortunately, was marginality. And they got it. The industry became stupidly marginal. If you look back to that decade, 2000 to 2010, when the gold price went up sevenfold, the free cash flow per share on the XAU fell. The mining industry actually presided over a decline in free cash flow when producing a commodity that increased sevenfold in price. That means that investor expectations that the gold industry will become efficacious stewards of capital hovers somewhere around zero. 
the industry, uh, I think, deserves that reputation. And the investors who asked the industry to be marginal deserve the punishment that they received. Looking forward a little bit in favor of the industry, while the gold prices increased, all of the inputs that they consume to produce gold have increased as well. Led, of course, by social rents, regulation, taxation, royalty, offsite expenditures. The industry reports that total social expense is increasing at about 20% compounded annually. But the price of other consumables, labor, cement, energy, steel, have all increased. So while the gold price has increased, the gold price hasn't increased relative to the expenditures required to produce gold. If we begin to see the type of move in the gold market, the metals market, that I think we're going to see, and if leadership in the gold market goes from central banks back to the private sector, the traditional constituency of gold buyer, uh, gold stock buyers, I think you'll see the gold stocks get much stronger. I think, too, that they're too cheap. As the gold price nears the $2,400 mark, marking another record high, it's poised for its third consecutive weekly gain. Several factors indicate a continued upward trajectory, with global interest rates potentially dropping, ongoing geopolitical tensions, and substantial U.S. debt issuance, gold remains an attractive option for investors seeking wealth preservation. Share your thoughts on Rick's prediction in the comments section below. Also, ensure you like this video, subscribe to the channel, and turn on post notifications for more videos like this. Thanks for watching.